Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Martha Lucy. I'm Deputy Director for Research, Interpretation, and Education here. I am very excited to, whoops, breaking the technology up here, to, uh, to introduce our speaker today, Michael Leja. Um, he is the, this is a long title, <laughs> I'm going to do it. The James and Nan Wagner Farquhar Professor of History of Art at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he is, Michael Leja is one of the, the world's leading scholars of 19th and 20th century American art, and that is not an exaggeration. Um, he's really at the front of the field. Um, his work, though, encompasses much more than the things that you find in museums, painting, sculpture. He studies visual culture more broadly um, as a way of understanding an historical period. So by visual culture, I'm, yes, talking about art, but I'm also talking about prints, popular illustrations, uh, photographs, um, cartoons, postcards, advertising. And in his work, he asks questions like, how do, how do images reflect who we are, but also how do they shape who we are? Professor Leja's first book, uh, published in 1993, was called Reframing Abstract Expressionism, um, and he is subjectivity and painting in the 1940s, and he uh, studied, he looked at the paintings of Jackson Pollock and others and situated them um, within a broader culture-wide cult, uh, culture initiative to reimagine the self in the midst of a traumatic history in the US. This book won the Charles Eldridge Prize for Distinguished Scholarship uh, from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. More recently, he co-authored uh, with John Davis a book called Art of the United States, 1750 to 2000, and it's a collection of primary sources, very important for the field. He's currently at work on a book exploring changes in pictorial forms and in social relations associated with the industrialization of picture production and the development of a mass market for images in the mid 19th century. Now, um, before I welcome Michael to the stage, I wanna jump back to 2004 um, to his uh, book published that year called Looking Askance, Skepticism and American Art from Aikens to Duchamp, which, um, and, and the reason is that, that this book, um, uh, his talk today really kind of goes back to this work. Um, the volume focuses on American art and visual culture in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and it explores how part of the modern experience in, in, in cities, in American cities, was a distrust of ordinary vision as a way of knowing the world and as a way of gathering reliable information about the world. The book won the Modernist Studies Association Book Prize back in 2005, but I, I think uh, we would all agree that these, this, this distrust of vision um, is a very relevant, more and more relevant topic um, in this era of AI and deep fakes and Photoshop. And so um, I'm so pleased that you're all here. Welcome to everybody online um, and welcome Michael Asia. Thank you, Martha, for that lovely introduction, and thank you all for coming. It's great to see you here. It's also great to see those of you who are online, and I can see those of you who are online, even if your camera is turned off. <laughs> I will know if you're paying attention. I'm just trying to get your skeptical juices flowing for this talk. So as Martha said, nearly 20 years ago, I published a book titled Looking Askance, um, which argued that a distinctive style of seeing was emerging among audiences for art in the later 19th century in the US. Viewers were looking art, and not only art, but other sights and spectacles as well, more skeptically than they had before. The group of women you see on the screen here strikes me as demonstrating something like this new visual practice, a kind of looking that is wary or suspicious with one eyebrow raised. 
and they would have had good reason for looking in this way because they were living in a culture in which skeptical seeing was a necessity. These particular women were visitors to the World's Fair in Buffalo in 1901, where among the impressive buildings and international exhibitions visible there, an army of enterprising marketers was out to captivate trusting souls with advertising tricks or distracting spectacles. They might have been, these women might have been among the crowds that followed a conspicuous pair of country bumpkins who were parading through the fairgrounds, loudly displaying astonishment at the, at the sights and inviting condescending amusement. Some onlookers suspected that they were hired actors, and indeed, once a large enough crowd had formed, they made a pitch for a brand of chewing gum. By this time, a vicious circle had been forming for decades. As people became wiser to the ways of marketers and hucksters, the advertisers became shrewder. Trade publications such as Printers Inc. published articles giving pointers on advertising to a skeptical market, uh, as one 1910 article was titled. It was not only manipulative advertising that fostered skeptical seeing around this time. Recent scientific and technological discoveries were radically altering the understanding of vision. Writer Theodore Dreiser articulated this effect quite vividly. Um, so I'm showing you some, as you see, some uh, early x-rays here. What could seem marvelous or strange, Dreiser wondered, in a world where x-rays revealed invisible depths. And to quote him, this new light, which before flesh, wood, aluminum, paper, and leather becomes as glass, sounds quite like some aged Arabian fiction. Who knows but that rocks and trees may yet be seemingly made to disappear and dark places be made light without any visible influence operating to affect it. Unquote. As he presented it, the visible world was becoming an enchanted realm where fantasy and reality were difficult to distinguish. So far, the evidence I've presented um, to document this decline in trust in visual appearances has been drawn from the print journalism of the period, which itself was part of the problem. Newspapers and magazines instructed their readers in the perils of seeing in the modern world and sensationalizing this phenomenon in its reporting. And these belonged to a fiercely competitive mass market um, medium whose own visual evidence was frequently dubious. An example is a practice of fraudulent newspaper portraits. Um, so because wood engraving, the, the medium that was used for reproducing portraits in, um, in mass publications at this time, wood engraving was a slow process. So newspapers sometimes prepared in advance ordinary portraits for politicians or celebrities whose days were thought to be numbered. The temptation to use these ready and waiting portraits for other purposes was sometimes irresistible. That's the case here when a portrait of Robert Toombs, who you see on the right, um, former congressman, senator, and Confederate general from the state of Georgia, that portrait was sitting idly among the wood engravings of the New York Morning Journal while its sitter outlived expectations. When a portrait suddenly was wanted to illustrate a story about a swindler named Garrett Underdunk, who sold hundreds of dozens of fake eggs to grocers in Patterson, New Jersey, Toombs' picture seemed to the editors like it might do the job. Don't ask uh, about the fake eggs, because I have no idea why there would be such a thing as an egg foundry, which is what produces these fake eggs. Unfortunately for the Morning Journal, Toombs died the same day as this portrait was used, and so his, the paper's deception became conspicuous and roundly condemned. And that's why I know about it, because of that uh, brouhaha. Not only were visual artifacts being used in deceptive ways, but vision itself as a perceptual faculty was proving itself an unreliable tool at this time. X-rays exposed its vision's inability to penetrate surfaces, and worse, the visual system generated its own illusions. Spiritualists and occult philosophers tracking visions, specters, and apparitions joined an unlikely alliance with psychologists formulating explanations for illusions, hallucinations, and false visions. <clears throat> On the 
Unreal sites of all sorts with a focus of intense interest in public discourse. Here, let me. I want to go back here. Here we are. A, a cup, a, an example of some, uh, some of these things. Unreal sites of all sorts with a focus of intense interest in public discourse, none more so than spirit photographs. And no spirit photographer was more notorious than uh, William Mumler. And here you see two, of, two examples of Mumler's work. In the spring of 1869, Mumler was brought to trial in New York City on two felony counts and one misdemeanor, all having to do with fraud, fraud, larceny, and obtaining money by trick and device. He was being prosecuted, in short, for selling fraudulent photographs. He'd been attracting a great deal of publicity for his spirit photographs, like these, which were made through darkroom trickery. And it's no, it's no simple matter to make some of these photographs, to make um, a picture uh, in which the, the, uh, the uh, ephemeral figure of the spirit has um, limbs that wind around the sitter in some cases so that it's, some things are passing behind and some in front. Mumley was a talented trickster. Um, these were made through darkroom trickery, but Mumler was able to convince his patrons that as a spiritual medium, he was able to make his camera reveal spirits that the human eye could not see merely by placing his hand on the camera during the exposure. The newspaper accounts and published records of Mumler's trial offer unusual insight into the development and diffusion of skeptical viewing of photographs. Earlier in the decade, many Americans had learned to dis discern truth in the Civil War photographs of Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner. But now photography was being revealed to that same public as yet another field for the practice of deception. One expert witness after another testified that photographs could be manipulated through multiple exposures and darkroom handling to yield what passed for spiritual presences. One surprising feature of the defense testimony is that so many of Mumler's supporters claimed to have been highly skeptical initially. They took advantage of Mumler's services while suspecting that he was a fraud. David Hopkins, for example, a manufacturer of railway cars, testified, I thought Mumler, before I went there, was a cheat. I watched Mr. Mumler just as carefully as I could, but could find nothing. Hopkins told the court that as an overseer of many workers, he was in the habit of watching people suspiciously to see that they did not cheat or steal from me. He said, I've been sometimes deceived, but not often. The banker, Charles Livermore, was part of the team of investigators who had prepared a report on Mumler for the New York Sun newspaper. He told the court, I went there with my eyes open as a skeptic. Livermore sought to throw Mumler off balance, he said. He made an appointment for a sitting on a Tuesday, but went on Monday to disconcert him. When Mumler was ready, was ready to make one exposure, Livermore, quote, suddenly changed my position so as to defeat any arrangement he might have made. In another, I made him suddenly bring the camera three feet nearer to me and then instantly proceed to take my picture. I was on the lookout all the while, unquote. Several witnesses testified that they had used false names in their initial dealings with Mumler, deliberately withholding information about the spirits they hoped to see. Portraying their support of Mumler as a conversion from skepticism was a good rhetorical strategy in the courtroom, and no doubt it was emphasized for that purpose. However, more than a legal strategy, skepticism was a fundamental virtue essential to any individual's dignity and self-respect. To be labeled credulous was an insult that impugned one's intelligence and discounted one's testimony. So the first core arg argument of the Looking Askance book is that the lived experience of US citizens in the late 19th century induced skepticism toward vision and visual artifacts as a survival strategy. The culture demanded it. The culture was producing it. As participants in an aggressively capitalist economy, as inhabitants of the nation's modern cities, as targets of competitive marketing, as participants in the new mass culture, as beneficiaries of modern science and technology, 
as believers in spiritual realms, everyone had to process visual experiences with some measure of suspicion, caution, and guile. Erosion of the public credulity, uh, to use the words of the time, was a topic of concern discussed in the popular press. So that's the first core argument of the book. The second one is that the visual arts, that is the fine arts, as well as the larger visual culture of commercial amusements, illustrations, and advertising, played complex roles in this process, fostering this suspicious way of looking and responding to it. The artists themselves had been shaped by this culture, so they understood the dispositions of their audiences. Suspicious lookers themselves, they learned to engage a viewership that peered out through skeptical eyes. Their art indulged skepticism or wrestled with it. So I'll, sh I'll give you um, a brief intro introduction to examples of artists who did either, either indulged skepticism or wrestled with it. Thomas Aikens was an artist who wrestled with skepticism. His work was designed to counter any doubts a viewer might have about the truth, the truth value of his pictures. I'll illustrate briefly with one of his paintings, this one. The Champion Single Skulls, Max Schmidt in a Single Skull from 1871, now at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. This picture commemorated the victory of Schmidt in amateur races on the Schuylkill, and its exhibition brought Aikens to public attention. He was working with an elaborate method of constructing images from numerous preliminary studies involving extensive scientific research into anatomy, optics, perspective, reflection, and motion. To begin with anatomy, there are some examples of anatomical studies that he did, not in preparation for that particular picture, but as part of his process of learning to represent the human body. These are um, um, a, a, a examples that go into a great level of detail to get the musculature exactly right. And he learned that through dissecting cadavers and studying anatomy in a medical school alongside medical students. And here, in this detail of Schmidt's anatomy, um, notice the meticulous um, musculature, which is incongruous in the brightly lit setting. He's out on a river on a sunny day, and so there's going to be a lot of reflective light bouncing off the water onto those backlit, onto those shadows. The modeling resembles a studio portrait more than a plain air picture. And, uh, you know, and this is not a great example to compare it with, but I can't. You know, it's, it's really, it's probably too much in the other extreme. This Manet is, Manet is deliberately flattening out, of course, the contrast for purposes of, of his, his own aesthetic um, program. But I think Manet might be closer to the truth of, of the kind of, um, of modeling of the arm one would see in such a brightly lit situation than Aikens is here. But Aikens' approach is deliberate it conveys more information about anatomy than veridical representation, representation that took the light into account, would allow. Perspective an example, uh, is an example of um, another kind of close study that Aikens undertook for his pictures. We don't have the one he did for the Schmidt painting, but um, he would have made one like this in order to position Schmidt's boat so precisely in receding space, getting exactly the right length of the foreground and the background to, co to conform to the perspective diagram that was shaping the space of the picture. Then we have things like this, a study of reflections and how they appear on moving water. This is operating in the background of, uh, well, I'll, when we look at the picture again, you'll see that, that, it, that it is moving water that is represented here, water that scullers are passing through and oars are, are, um, uh, are moving around. And it's that water that's reflecting very carefully the objects that are behind. Cast shadows also studied scientifically by Aikens. How the, what kind of shape and what kind of intensity a shadow will, would have at a certain distance from the object casting it. And then there's 
Sculling, the art of sculling itself. Aikens was a practitioner. He knew it. And he was making sure that people knew that he knew it by putting himself in the middle of this picture. That's a self-portrait rowing into the distance on a boat signed with his name. That's where he signed the picture, Thomas Aikens, and dated it, 1871. Notice that his hands are in the right position so that you don't crack your knuckles as you're drawing the oars back. And um, you can see the oar pools, these pools left by the oars as he moves into the distance. Are, are, there's very little perturbed water. They're very smooth. They're evenly spaced. Um, there's, you know, that, that's a measure of his control as a sculler. Um, and also about boat design. That's something else that you see. Seeing the oar rings remaining intact on the water's surface, which enables the viewer to know more precisely the, the rower's spatial orientation and trajectory, like everything else in the painting, they've been rendered in careful perspective. But are they too intact? Are they a little too tightly contained? And are they too close together for a boat that would be moving at the speed of Aikens as it's uh, receding and making that wake as, as it moves? For the purpose of conveying a clear narrative in the picture, they work very efficiently, but they might be unrealistic. They might be contrivances that serve to tell the story more so than uh, the truth. And what about the absence of reflections in the picture? I mean, notice how um, this white bridge and this red boat should have reflections somewhere around here. You know, if you think about the reflection of this tree and their relation to those other forms, why, are, why is there no sign of them in the water? When there's so much, look at this, this is an area where you can see the careful attention to how reflected forms in moving water would be, would be shown. Um, Aikens has clearly left out some reflections if they would interfere with the, with, the, with the telling of the narrative of the motion of this boat from downriver coming upstream here and, and Schmidt allowing his oar to begin dragging. He's, he was making beautiful pools all along until just about here, and he starts dragging his oars. And, and Aikens moving in the opposite direction downstream. So that narrative was important to him. He wanted that to be clear. And he would have to leave out some things from his other careful um, preliminary studies in order to get that narrative um, front and center. Aiken's commitment to, uh, oh, so, so this picture, sorry, this picture contains many odd disjunctions despite the laborious scientific preparatory studies, or rather because of them. Aiken's commitment to communicating scientific truths about the visible world led him to bump up continually against the limits of the seen world to contain and display truthful information. Contemporary viewers recognize the evidence of arduous analytical research that went beyond appearances in his work, as they did the conflicts that such study, studies created. One critic wrote of the disjunctions, this is what happens when an artist paints what is instead of what seems to be. A rift was opening between the truths of scientific knowledge, knowledge systems, and the ambiguities or deceptions of perceptual experience. And Aikens went to the limit to paint a world of appearances that was better able than ours to display its natural truths and capable of putting to rest any viewer's suspicions of deception. So Aikens is an artist who is wrestling with skepticism in his audience. A very different way of engaging skeptical viewers in painted illusions is evident in the hyper-illusionistic still lives of William Harnett. Harnett was the most prominent and influential trompe l'oeil painter working in Philadelphia and New York in the late 19th century. Trompe l'oeil being French for fool the eye. So, uh, um, so uh, meticulous in their rendering of objects and keeping the space so shallow that there are no real, not any real strong cues about the, uh, the deception involved in the illusion. Writers marveled at, a at um, Harnett's paintings and sometimes praised them as extravagantly among the most remarkable illusions ever produced by the brush of an artist. Such claims stand out even in the hyperbolic commentary on contemporary illusions from this time. Newspaper articles discussing Harnett's work sometimes mentioned that a police guard had been stationed nearby to ensure that viewers kept their hands off. 
When his painting, The Old Violins, when you see on the screen, was exhibited at the Cincinnati Industrial Exposition in 1886, journalists wrote that spectators attempted with their fingernails to remove the newspaper clipping, brilliant, brilliantly rendered um, just below and to the left of the violin. One Cincinnati reporter, here, let me show you a detail of that. It's pretty good. One Cincinnati reporter even admitted having run his own hand over that clipping. And here's what he said. While the iron hinges, the ring and staple and the rest are marvelous, the newspaper clipping is simply a miracle. The writer, this writer, being one of those doubting Thomases who are by no means disposed to believe their own eyes, was permitted to allay his conscientious scruples by feeling it and is prepared to kiss the book and so help me it is painted. I like the so help me, an oath to convince any skeptical readers who might doubt not only that the clipping was painted but that the critic was telling the truth about it. Lots of skeptical defenses operating here. Harnett's paintings invited skeptical viewers to engage in a game of visual acuity and wit. Are the things before you real or are they painted illusions? They were sometimes exhibited in taverns and saloons, like this one. Um, and um, where low light and impaired perception increased the challenge of discernment. This is Theodore Stewart's upscale saloon on Warren Street in New York, where our Harnett's After the Hunt famously sparked endless debate and hilarity. Skepticism could easily become misguided and lead to blatant deception. Though we must be skeptical of such newspaper reports, they allege that some naive, usually rural viewers of Harnett's paintings suspected that they were being duped by the proprietors of cafes and bars who hung real objects on a wall and claimed that they were paintings. In these cases, the country folk did not simply fall for the painted illusions, they believed they were being made the butt of a joke. So-called rubes maintained that, quote, nobody can take them in and that the objects are real objects hung up with the intent to deceive people, unquote. Such viewers were not credulous innocents. They were not unskeptical. They were just clumsy skeptics or wild ones. One of the features of Harnett's paintings much admired by early commentators um, th this is the painting that was hung in um, Stewart's saloon. One of the features of Harnett's paintings much admired by early commentators was the strong impression of sensuous texture radiated by the still life objects portrayed in them. The surfaces of familiar things acquired heightened tactility through Harnett's use of lighting and chiaroscuro, the way they were modeled in light and shade, as well as through his juxtaposition of contrasting materials. One commentator, from the period was explicit on this point. The artist shows the highest skill in the representation of textures. The wood is wood, the iron is iron, the brass is brass, the leather is leather, the fur of the rabbit and the feathers of the bird tempt the hand to feel their delicate softness. Viewers were tempted to touch the paintings not only to verify that the objects were painted, but also in hope of tactile gratification. So having seduced viewers to desire the pleasures of touching and holding material things, Harnett's paintings taunt them with passages that suggest points of entry into the illusion. Here is his still life, Violin and Music from 1888, which offers a particularly clear example of this. The painting shows various items hung on the door of an old wooden cupboard. The lock is undone, the clasp hangs disengaged, and the door has swung slightly open, throwing a strong shadow magnified by the angle of lighting. As if these elements were not enough to induce in viewers a temptation to open this door, Harnett has given the bare wood at the edge of the door just opposite the lock a smooth, worn finish. This device, accomplished by laying an even brown wash over the green of the door, enhances the invitation by assuring spectators who might yield to the impulse of a splinterless and pleasureless tactile experience. Um, uh, a splinterless and pleasurable tactile experience. Harnett's calling card is mounted on the door at the lower right, one corner curling out toward viewers, inviting them to follow it into the crevice between the two boards. 
An emblem of the artist, the card occupies the very position the painting leads the viewer to desire, one foot in and one out of the illusion. At the same time, the card seems an instrument of entry. In marked contrast to Aiken's paintings, Harnett's activate the skepticism of viewers. They engage in a game of pictorial illusionism that induces psychic conflict, leading viewers to succumb visually to an illusion at the same time that they recognize it as an illusion. The paintings demonstrate that seeing through an illusion does not diminish its effects. In the modern world of the US in the late 19th century, this was a familiar and somewhat disturbing experience. Harnett's paintings alleviated that anxiety by making it part of a delightful game. Let me introduce briefly one more example drawn from the early 20th century before moving closer to our present time. No artist a century ago was treated more skeptically than Marcel Duchamp. When he exhibited his new Descending the Staircase at the Armory Show in 1913, he was widely reviled as a charlatan perpetrating a fraud upon his viewers. American Art News, in the first of its several reports on the exhibition, said the painting was, quote, already the conundrum of the season in New York. The critic explained, up to the present writing, I understand that no one has yet been able to make out what looks like, make out of what looks like a collection of saddlebags, either the lady or the stairway. The next week, the same publication offered a $10 prize to anyone who could find the lady in the painting. <laughs> Two years after the Armory Show, Duchamp arrived in New York, where he was already an art celebrity. In three months, he became fluent enough in English to be interviewed by the American press, and through that medium, he stoked the publicity engine as effectively as anyone. Here's a clipping of one of his interviews, his newspaper interviews. Headlines labeled him an iconoclast, and put in boldface the most provocative of his remarks. America is the country of the art of the future. Cubism was the prophet of war. The American woman is the most intelligent of her sex. And the subtitle there was, hasn't she proved it by making her husband in his role of slave banker look almost ridiculous in the eyes of the whole world? And so forth. The painter of the infamous nude thrust sex into the face of the puritanical culture and exploded figurative bombs one after another that represented complete reversals of prevailing opinions, to use the breathless language of the reporters. And in the winter of that year, as his celebrity flourished, he began a period of concentrated work on the ready-mades, the most famous of which is this one, Fountain, from 1917. He submitted this urinal titled Fountain and signed R. Mutt to the exhibition of the Society of Independent Artists in New York in 1917. He interposed this fictitious middleman, R. Mutt, between himself and the work as he would when he presented other works purportedly by his alter ego, Rose Salavi. The name, is, the name signaled trickery. R. Mutt inevitably brought to mind the popular Mutt and Jeff comic strip. Duchamp brought the, uh, gave the object a new name, Fountain, that required viewers to see it allegorically as both itself, a urinal, and a work of art, a fountain. It invited viewers to observe transformations in the object as it shifted between those identities, its aura as a work of art, waxing and waning. Fountain would put viewers on their guard. It presented a problem demanding skeptical perception and suspicion no amount of which would enable a solution. While, while Fountain was rejected from the unjuried exhibition, Duchamp tried to orchestrate a media spectacle around the event. He created a stir by resigning from the board of managers of the Society of Independent Artists and said, quote, I have handed in my resignation and it will be a bit of gossip of some value in New York. This is what he wrote to his sister about the whole, the whole fiasco. He arranged to have Alfred Stieglitz photograph Fountain, that's the photograph you see here on the screen, and keep the work on display at his 291 gallery for a week, where it would be available to curious critics, journalists, artists, and others. Meanwhile, he and his associates tried to persuade sympathetic critics to come to the gallery to see the scandalous object and to write about it. One of Duchamp's associates, Louise Norton, wrote an essay 
on Fountain for The Blind Man, a magazine that Duchamp co-edited. She wrote, those who, uh, there are those who anxiously ask, is he serious or is he joking? Perhaps he is both. It puts it rather up to you. There is among us today a spirit of blog, arising, so that's the end of the quote, arising out of the artist's bitter vision of an over-institutionalized world of stagnant statistics and antique axioms. Her words left no doubt that Fountain was designed to put skeptical viewers on alert. The possibility of deception was always endemic to modernist art. While it was an art that defined itself in opposition to the deceptions of appearances and the fraudulence of illusionism, it necessarily presented its audiences with far greater risks of fraud than the academic art that it challenged. Modernism's perpetual reinvention of the fundamental tenets of artistic practice and aesthetic evaluation meant that its public would always be scrambling to devise frameworks for interpretation and estimation of quality. When standards of achievement are constantly being overturned, the window for deception is wide open. Modernism intensified and revealed the risk of fraudulence always present in representation, and Fountain underlined this fact. Philosopher Stanley Cavell has written that, quote, the dangers of fraudulence and of trust are essential to the experience of art. Modernism only makes explicit and bare what has always been true of art, unquote. Duchamp threw this aspect of modernism into high relief for the New York viewers of the Armory Show and the Independence Exhibition. Those audiences and critics habituated to constant vigilance against deception and, and illusion immediately recognized the magnified risks of fraudulence modernism posed. Well, Aikens, Harnett, Duchamp formulated and tested important strategies for making art that engages an audience of skeptics. From our vantage in the present, um, their work might strike us as a little bit quaint on this front. I suspect most of you will agree that the cultural demands on us, 21st century viewers of art, the demands on us to be skeptical viewers have only gotten more intense. One might even say they've become relentless and excruciating. Trust is something rare now, as we learn from those who study such things, the Pew Tr Research Trust talking about declining, or documenting declining trust in government and each other by significant amounts. Um, the, so the Pew Trust has, has charted this precipitous decline and the dangers associated with it. Even our most banal daily behaviors demand skeptical assessments. If you click on the wrong picture, your computer might be taken hostage or your identity stolen. As a teacher, I can't just grade the arguments in student papers I have to try to discern whether AI programs were involved in producing them. Artists have moved with the times, or at least um, some of the most interesting have. We still have artists redoing Duchamp's ready-mades and asking familiar old questions about the boundaries of art. This um, notorious piece from 2019, um, Maurizio Catalan's um, piece called Comedian, which was a banana tape duct, duct taped to a, the wall of a gallery at um, Art Basel, Miami, which sold for $120,000, incidentally, um, just is, is reactivating an old dynamic. The fear of being duped or being taken advantage of by uh, an avant-garde artist is greater than ever, but not so interesting anymore. In the 1960s and 70s, some artists began directing skeptical attention to different boundaries not the one between art and non-art, or between representation and reality, as Aikens had. They shifted the pressure to boundaries between categories of pictures. Did the pictures we were presented with actually belong to the categories uh, that they resembled? Early movements in this direction were pop art. For example, Roy Lichtenstein's um, uh, large-scale painting of a comic strip, um, were pop art paintings comic strips or advertisements or photographs? Um, this is not pop art, this is photorealism, uh, you know, a late 60s, 70s phenomenon that was similar insofar as it was 
emulating another medium, another category of pictures in the medium of painting. This is a photorealist painting by Richard Estes, and you see it's called Double Self Portrait. You can see his own reflection in the, uh, uh, in the store window standing by the camera that made the photograph on which the painting is based. So the, so the picture is advertising its photographic basis rather than a basis in the world. It's the, it's the photograph that is the, um, it, it's the boundary between photography and painting that is being pressured here. And then the challenge of these kinds of movements was, was ratcheted up a notch by the pictures artists of the 1970s and 80s, who sometimes appropriated advertisements or works of art wholesale. People like um, Sherry Levine, this photograph, uh, it's a gelatin silver print copying a previously existing photograph by Walk Walker Evans. Um, is this of, of a, um, an illustration of a work of art, or is it another work of art made from a prior work of art? And simulated movie stills. Cindy Sherman putting herself into situations, framing um, images that make us wonder whether we are seeing a still from an actual movie from an earlier period, or whether this is a work of art. Um, um, uh, uh, piggybacking on that kind of imagery. Some of the anxiety triggered by these works concerned our mastery over the categories of pictures that we must process and live with every day. If those categories are slippery or insecure, the costs of our mistakes may be quite high. The work of art's relation is not to the real world per se, but to the world of representations became the challenge requiring, requir requiring skeptical assessment. Artists interested in political critique also adopted this approach, simulating campaign materials or advertisements. Hans Hacke was, was one who did this very early on, pointing to problems in Ronald Reagan's um, uh, cutting of social programs with that um, slogan, yes, my son collects unemployment too, that's Reaganomics. And um, the other advertisement on the side for, um, it's a, a phony advertisement uh, pointing to the cruelty of American cyan cyanamid, uh, the parent company of Brecht, which was telling its female employees of childbearing age at this time that if they were exposed to toxic, toxic substances in their work, they have a choice of either quitting or taking reassignment to a lower paying job or um, becoming sterilized go, to go on with that existing job. Some performance artists impersonated powerful figures to call attention to hypocritical policies or behaviors. So we've got fraudulent advertisements and campaign materials, but there are also these artists who are, who are masquerading as um, government officials and corporate executives, uh, like the Yes Men. This is their piece, Survivor, Survivor Ball, from 2006 a protective suit that would enable wealthy individuals to survive climate disasters or civic strife. Here you see the product in the corner, you see that guy with the head popping out of it. You wear that suit and you're protected. You know, obviously this is a parody of the dangers that these corporate, uh, that the Halliburton Corporation is actually exposing the world to, but here um, they're, um, they're putting together a product, an advertisement that um, calls that uh, hypocrisy, uh, uh, calls it out. The artists pretended to be Halliburton executives holding press conferences and making presentations at professional conferences, and they confronted members of Congress insisting that their constituents be supplied with these suits um, for their own safety. And there are, there are photographs of um, uh, Arlen Specter being chased by individuals in this suit as he's trying to avoid confrontation. We can't be sure, I mean, just carrying on with, uh, with other performance artists who, um, who uh, also um, um, work in this mode, we can't be sure that our workplace has not been appropriated by a conceptual or performance artist for a work of some kind or an artistic project. Pilvi Takala, for example, is a performance artist who masquerades as an ordinary employee over a, periods of, a period of months to find ways to disrupt institutional operations. 
to expose buried assumptions about good and bad behavior and about how these codes are enforced. So the people we work with, new on a job, might be artists making art of our work. We have to, you know, that's a ratcheted up level of skepticism required to be able to pick out that kind of development. And with the arrival of artificial intelligence and deep fake technology, new ways of impersonating humans emerged. In 2019, Bill Posters and Daniel Howe released Big Data, a series of five AI-generated deepfake artworks into Instagram's algorithms, released as a digital intervention and a subversion of, this is in their words, it was, it, this, these works were released as a digital intervention and a subversion of the digital influence industry. Our approach was to take AI and machine learning to hack and subvert the power of celebrity influencers. We believe these five video pieces are the world's first contemporary art deep fakes created to interrogate the power of computational propaganda. And so this, the piece you see on the screen is uh, one of the five which went viral on Instagram and then trended on Twitter and was quickly picked up by the New York Times, um, Good Morning America, ABC News, and so forth. And it shows Mark Zuckerberg um, saying what we wanted to hear him say. Um, you know, he's increasing the trans transparency advertisements and taking measures to protect elections. One extreme and distorted form of skepticism is what psychologists called conspiracist ideation, a mindset that, to quote one study, typically attributes the causes of crises and social upheavals to the secret workings of powerful agents who control events favorable to their interests rather than to the public. Conspiracy belief is a judgment. This is continuing the, the uh, definition from one of these papers. Conspiracy belief is a judgment that it is probable that an actor or a group of actors is secretly working to produce an unlawful or harmful outcome for others in society. Some people are more disposed than others to see events in conspiratorial terms. Well, in our recent history, this conspiracist mindset has generated outlandish theories sometimes utterly free of anything close to what might pass for evidence. Think QAnon or Pizzagate or the opposition to COVID vaccines. But not all conspiracy theories are evidence-free, however. Some contemporary artists and activists have chosen to focus their work on exposing the exercise of power by forces that prefer to remain unseen. Among these, are the collective forensic architecture um, based at Goldsmiths College in London, um, the Center for Land Use Interpretation, or individual artists like Alfredo Yar and Trevor Paglin. I'll show you one of Paglin's works as an example of this kind of um, conspiracy theorized, uh, conspiracy based art. Um, right. So, uh, one, one facet of Paglin's work grew from his 2009 book, Blank Spots on the Map, The Dark Geography of the Pentagon's Secret World. He photographically documented classified military intelligence facilities, calling attention to military black sites, that is, sites that do not appear on maps, but can be documented in the real world. That's why his photographs are usually taken from great distances and are a little blurry. He also traces government and private satellite systems and other technologies that exert enormous but often unseen influence. This is to say that some evidence-based forms of conspiracy theorizing would qualify, in my book, as healthy skepticism, although their prominence in politics and the media at present is dwarfed by unhealthy forms. And lastly, there is artificial intelligence art. Durific Anadol's videos, like this one, uh, which take all of the information about the Museum of Modern Art's collection, and that's information about the uh, reproductions of the works, the look of the works, as well as the metadata about them, the size and the date and so forth, and sort that information into clusters and generate forms that fill the gaps. Do these do anything more then mesmerize us like a lava lamp, because that's what's happening. This is a constantly ch changing flow of forms on this projected screen, which you see here. Or is there value in such work in its frustration of, in, of our desire to interpret art as human symbol 
or expression. The skepticism such work stimulates in viewers now has parallels with those activated by Duchamp's ready-mades. Can we, ex can we extend the kind of attention we've traditionally given to art to images that result from the processing of data by learning machines, a process devoid of human experience and intentionality? Anadol wants us to see such works as revealing, in his words, a strange world of collective art histories as imagined by a dreaming machine. So to conclude, I want to return to some of the closing sentences in the Looking Askance book. Um, here's what I wrote. Our current skepticism about images is sometimes classified as postmodern. I hope these episodes described in the book have shown that skepticism has a long history rooted deep in the culture of modernity and in national values of entrepreneurship, invention, competition, and unregulated marketing. For better or worse, we have inherited the visual culture our modern life and modern values have wanted. Well, I think that's a little bit dated. We don't talk about postmodernism anymore, but still 20 years later, I'll stand by the thought. Thank you. And if any of you have questions or comments, um, I'd be really happy to hear them. Um, and Martha, are you, do you get comments from online as well? As? Yes. So, okay. Um, thank you, Michael. You've given us so much to think about, and um, I'm sure there are some questions. So um, I'm just going to ask that, that you wait for me to pass you the microphone so that everybody can hear and so that people online can hear. And if, uh, if there are questions from the online audience, um, and there are quite a few people tuning in online, um, please type them into the chat and I will read them. So, who'd like to start? Okay, well, we do have one online, so I'll start there. Um, what do, uh, somebody asks, what do you think about um, Andy Warhol today? I, I think Andy Warhol has emerged as uh, you know, someone to be reckoned with. Um, whether you like his work or not, he's had an influence that goes beyond uh, the norm. I would say, in terms of the presentation I've just given, I didn't show a work by him, but I very easily could have, instead of the Liechtenstein um, comic strip, I could have show, uh, shown one of his comic strips or one of his advertisements or one of the many other forms of pictures that he um, conflated with um, with art and, and forced us to think about, you know, I th I, th I think um, Warhol is an important artist, and um, you know, many have have. F I think it, you know, to some extent, he's following in the tradition of Duchamp, with uh, dealing with ready-made materials, but um, he he brought a cleverness and a new model of the artist to his work that really was influential for future generations and has really, it's really shaped the landscape that we live with today. Yes. Is this the microphone? Yep. <laughs> oh, hi, thank you, how fascinating. I have a question about intention on the part, on the one hand of the creator of a piece of art and on the other hand, the recipient of the work, the observer of it. And I imagine sometimes people do some form of artistic expression and they're not intending to fool you or even play with you, but there may be something in the work that is confusing or causes reflection. And then uh, if you get, on the other hand, people who are looking at the art, I'm not going to be fooled. I'm not going to pay $120,000 for that banana taped on the wall. Well. Did the artist have any intention, actually, any hope that this would happen? So I think there's a fascinating confusion around intentions and responses, because once you reveal a piece of creativity to the world, then that whole galaxy of responses is going to gather. And you're left over time and forever to interpret that. Yes, wonderful comment. Um, 
I don't. I don't think it's really a question, but I agree completely that you know the um, the, uh, the the artist's intention is one thing. It's only one component in the production of the meaning and the significance of the work. What happens to it when it when it emerges into public space and people start responding and making something of it and becomes shaped in public discourse as having a certain meaning? That's beyond the control of the artist. To me, that's. That's the really important meaning. What happens once the, the artist's intention and the audience's interpretation mix, and the work becomes part of part of you know the way people think, the way they talk, of what they argue about. Um, it's 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 getting to the getting to that crux that I think is really the 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 important thing to get at in um, in understanding um, some of these historical works. Thank you. You described the growth of the intentional duplicity, however, also in a way that, uh, as we're all trying to struggle with now, uh, is just completely out of hand, it appears. Uh, but are we becoming savvy enough, and do we have tools or resources that will prepare us uh, for, uh, so that we are keeping up with, uh, uh, with what Otherwise, seems like some days just a, a hopeless future. <laughs> yeah, I understand where you're coming from. Um, it's um, you know I think if 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 we hold on to the desire for some kind of bedrock truth about um, who, who what was you know what was the intent of the artist what was the meaning of the work what is what is its what is its what is its being what is its, it, its essence we're going to have we're going to be frustrated because i don't i think i think as as at present with ai work um i don't know if i could, well if we can get the uh, the last slide back up on the screen yeah with with artificial intelligence work um you, you, there, there are, there are. I think there are now some ways of of being able to tell whether it was artificially generated or not. But I, I think the day is coming when we're going to have to live with the ambiguity of not knowing how much of it is human influenced and how much of it is machine made. And you know, art has always been the place where we learn to live with ambiguity. You know, we have to. You know, we. we it's not science. There's, there's scientific knowledge, and then there is art, there's non-scientific knowledge, which is uncertain, and where the ambiguities and doubts and um, uh, uncertainties have to be wrestled with, and we have to work out problems. I think art's going to continue to play that role. It's always going to be one step ahead of what we're able to fully um, grapple with. But, you know, that's the fun of it. That's the challenge. I, would, I wouldn't say it's hopeless. <laughs> we just have to shift our, our point of view for what we're looking for and think critically about what we've been looking for and whether that's still what we need to keep looking for. I don't know if that makes sense. Hi. Um, thank you so much. Um, my question is kind of along the same vein. Um, I was wondering if maybe you had any advice to push against um, where art seems to be going, um, or if that's a, a contemporary double standard, um, because I'm an oil painter and I want to keep oil painting. Um, so I would embrace the Duchamp evolution, but not the modern day equivalent. So um, my ultimate question is, is there anything we can do to hang on um, to this last chapter? Or is it maybe not the viewer's place um, to try and hang on? Well, you're not a viewer. You're a producer. So you've got, you are definitely a voice, and you have to make that voice heard. Um, you know, I've, I've presented a very selective um, um, sample of contemporary art. Yeah, you know, I don't. First of all, I am no expert on on the, on the broad field of contemporary art. I'm just, you're, what you're seeing is work that has struck me as interesting over the past couple of decades in terms of thinking about its relation to skeptical seeing. There's all kinds of 
great arguments going on in the world of conceptual art. People reacting against this and absolutely wanting us to hold on to certain traditional skills and forms of interaction with art. And I hope those battles will continue to be fought out. And you should absolutely um, not capitulate. I mean, I, I, I didn't want to make an argument for the value of this direction. I just want, it's something I'm observing. So I think you should go with your your gut feelings and um, you know, and vote with your paintbrush for what the future should be like. I, I think that um, you know I, I feel hopeless too sometimes, <laughs> and there's a certain amount of despair in your question, which I feel too. And um, you're a producer of of oil painting, and you know, Michael, you're 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 a writer and. A lot of us in the room are. I'm a writer, and I now we're in a stage, an age of skeptical reading because we don't know if what we're reading is, you know, human produced or not. And that I am trying to find ways to not be upset about that and terrified by that. But of course, you know, I am. I don't know. I think we're in a. This is the, the psychological <laughs> impact of all of this is so big that you can't. It's like hard to even get your head around it. Um, I want to read a, a question from um, from one Margaret Worth online. <laughs> uh, is there a figure in our culture today similar to the figure of the rube, uh, like a, or a gullible viewer who might be understood as either actually credulous or used to display the process of acquiring skepticism? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. Who's the contemporary rube? Um, I think that's true. I don't know if I should say this. Go ahead. You got an idea? Please. Um, I think I think for uh, I think for a lot of people, the contemporary Rube is the the um, Trump voter. Or the QAnon believer, right? Yeah, yes, okay, the right. QAnon believer, the people who. Um, just refuse to that sort of that sort of fall for the deception that's that's happening. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that would be you know we're, we're that would be a highly contested <laughs> contemporary. Highly, right. <laughs> yeah, but it, as would the as would the country folk you know the the people from the country in the nineteenth century wouldn't have liked the portrayal of them in the urban press. Right. So that's always going to be the case. Um, let's see. Margaret's trying to make trouble. I know. I see. I just. I shouldn't say what. I, I shouldn't say things like. That. Um, does our approach? Somebody else asks, to understanding surrealist art, um, compa compare to skepticism, um, such as in terms of how we understand reality or society according to a painting. I guess how 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 does kind of surrealism, surrealism yeah. figure into all of this? Well, surrealism surrealism is. Um, um, presenting itself as work that's coming from the unconscious or the irrational faculties in human mind and behavior. And so if you are skeptical that that's not what your irrational looks like or what you believe the irrational looks like, then right, there would be a, you know, you are having to bring to bear your critical faculties on whether that artist is truly delving into the unconscious or the irrational in some real way or whether one is just kind of faking it. You know, that's one way of thinking about the test of surrealism. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, one quick note about surrealism. I think I was really struck in your discussion of spirit photography, which I've always loved um, in terms of blurring the boundary between the real and the imagined, um, the real and the potential, the real and the virtual, which is the terrain of, of surrealism, I would say it's perhaps a more utopic vision of producing an intentional ambiguity um, in order to dream up a better future where, where, where those distinctions don't matter. So I, but I think it, it's a really interesting question um, in terms of the historical lineage. I was so interested in, in the way that you framed this question historically and culturally uh, as well in terms of, of your treatment of this as a, in the context of American history. And I wanted to ask 
if you see parallels in other countries and other cultures, is this for you a facet of modernism and industrialization and urbanization and um, writ large, or is there something distinctively American about this phenomenon? Um, you spoke a little bit about the, the Civil War photography, um, which I thought was so interesting as sort of a document of truth. Is there is there something unique to American history in the 19th century and, and the birth of America as a nation that you think also contributes to a particular version of this skeptical viewing? That's a great question. I, I do think that this is something you would find in any modernizing culture. But I also think that the United States was the place where it became most acute because it was the place where um, where development was unfettered, where capitalism, you know, was not constrained, and um, and it was not the United States was known internationally as the place of aggressive, deceptive marketing. P. T. Barnum was held up as the uh, you know the patron saint of the United States, who was whose humbugs were notorious. There were frauds that people delighted in in patronizing, despite the fact that they were frauds. So, what kind of place is this where? People love having, you know, f f false, you know, deceptions that they that they that are the center of their interactions. Um, when Barnum died in the late nineteenth century, his obituary in foreign publications held him up as, you know, the, he was like George Washington as the father of the country in some ways. So, so I think the United States d did have that kind of reputation, deservedly so, because they. I think there is more. Of this kind of of um, of playing with with uh, skeptic, skeptical viewing, then I, I you know I'm no expert on the on the other modernizing cultures, but I, this is my sense that it is more acute here. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you everyone um, for coming and for your great questions. Thank you so much, Michael. Brilliant, brilliant talk. Um, I hope you keep going with this because uh, we really need somebody to be. I don't know, uh, chewing on this and <laughs> analyzing it and, um, and writing about it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mark.